Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Critical Conversations. Find a comfortable seat. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting and awesome night ahead of us uh, as we explore a very interesting personality tonight. But before that, you know, uh, Dennis asked me to briefly share a little bit about some of the work that we do at Leadernomics. And at Leadernomics, one of the core part of what we do uh, is to serve kids in school. So we run lots of leadership clubs and all these are free for kids to become better leaders. Our dream is that if we can take one person and make them a better leader, the community they serve, the organizations they serve, the people, the rukuntatanga, the neighborhood, the family that they serve will be a better family. And if we have many, many great communities, we will see a transformed nation. So very quickly, I just want to, as we kick it off, just before we have Dennis and our special guest join us tonight, uh, here's a quick look at Leaderonomics community and the clubs that we do in schools. And now, Critical Conversations. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations. Uh, in my book, uh, Paradise Lost, Mahade and the End of Hope, I raised a, a number of critical questions about the future of Malaysia. Now, Critical Conversations seeks to continue that discussion uh, by engaging newsmakers, lawmakers, and policymakers, uh, and asking them the hard questions digging deeper into some of the sensitive issues and engaging them on their policies and vision for Malaysia. I hope to engage, you know, I hope to engage as many leaders as possible from every political party, government and opposition, religious and secular. You may not like all of them, but they all have a story to try to tell and questions to answer. My goal as always is to help Malaysians better understand the people and the issues that are shaping our nation because I believe that an informed electorate is a vital part of our democracy and it's intrinsic to good government. That is and will always be my only agenda. By the way, have you noticed that suddenly there, there's a whole lot of new books uh, on politics that have come out, including uh, Dr. Made's book, Capturing Hope, The Struggle for a New Malaysia, a book about Lim Kitsiang from, uh, uh, by Keith Wan Chai, um, and then there's another book, The Alternate Malay Universe by A.B. Sulaiman. I'm actually quite happy that so many people are coming out with different books because they provide us with different perspectives, different narratives, 
and it's a good thing. Okay. Oh, oh, and before I forget, uh, those, both those old warriors, Tun Dr. Mahade and YB Lim Kit Siang, have agreed to come and to appear on Critical Conversations sometime in January. Uh, I'll post more details nearer the date, so stay in touch. But this evening, my guest is perhaps the youngest warrior of them all, uh, YB Tuan Said Sadik, the member of parliament for MUA and co-founder of MUDA. Uh, um, he famously went straight from college to the cabinet. He was the minister, the minister of youth and sport at the age of 25, the youngest minister, one of the youngest MPs ever to be elected, as a founding member of uh, PPBM, Basatu, uh, and his first youth chief, co-founder of Malaysia, Uni Malaysian United Democratic Alliance, or MUDA, and has won uh, the Asian Best Speaker Award and three times champion of the Asian British Parliamentary Debating Competition. YB Said Sadik, welcome to Critical Conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danny, for having me. It's a pleasure. First, congratulations are in order. You scored a major victory today as the courts ordered that your party be registered within 14 days. Tell us what it means to you and the significance of it. It's a, it's a day full of emotions because the landmark victory today was started about a year and a half ago when 13 of us, uh, teachers, ex-civil servants, uh, professionals, technocrats, young corporates, uh, civil society leaders came together uh, to form uh, Malaysia's multiracial, multi-religious, moderate, policy-based party called MUDA, Malaysian United Democratic Alliance, which is meant to work to build Malaysia to become a developed country, a dignified country, which represents the interests of all Malaysians, regardless of race and religion, rich and poor, young and old, regardless of backgrounds, uh, to make and turbocharge uh, Malaysia forward. And we went through many barriers, uh, government um, attempting to stop us uh, many ways, uh, whether it's through threats, whether it's through uh, ways to, to get us over to join Prikata National, and then why, subsequently why so through the courts. Why, why are they so afraid of you? Uh, I think that question should be asked uh, towards them. But if really their claim is true, that we are a bunch of young imbeciles without experience, uh, uh, who are just here to wreak havoc of Malaysia, then give us a chance uh, to take place, uh, to, 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 to be a part of uh, Malaysian democracy. Because to be honest, sir, we're not here to burn bridges. We're not here to burn Malaysia down. We're here to build more bridges to make Malaysia a developed country, a dignified country, and, uh, and to serve all Malaysians, regardless of political affiliation. So I'm not here to exert revenge. I'm here to work for all Malaysians. Okay, I, I want to come back to that. But let me ask you this now. You literally went from the, the, the classroom to the cabinet. Uh, you were Many felt you were promoted by Dr. Made, despite the fact that you've had no experience uh, and you've been heckled in parliament. Uh, you In parliament, uh, somebody called you Buddha Kichil or small boy. Tell me, was your age and the lack of experience a handicap? How challenging was it for you to suddenly find yourself sitting in cabinet? I've always wanted to be a civil servant. I've always wanted to be in public service because I come from a family of teachers. Uh, my mom is a teacher. I was a lecturer myself before I joined politics. I was a researcher for the Joe state government or their think tank called Bait Alamana. I used to work as an officer to the uh, Minister of Law and had the privilege of traveling more than 25 countries to teach debating and public speaking, to lecture on international relations. Um, and I started working at a very young age. Um, at the age of uh, 21 years old, uh, I broke my university's record and subsequently Asia's record, which then enabled me to teach in the International Islamic University of Malaysia, therefore being the youngest part-time lecturer uh, while being a student and from there onward being able to travel across the world to teach. I was uh, in, 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 in a way caught in, in, in politics um, due to my outspokenness. Um, debating taught me to be a critical thinker to always speak my mind no matter what challenges confront my way and age is always an issue i remember when i was 
um, chosen to be the co-founder of Versatu, uh, many thought that it was a suicidal move. Uh, selecting a 22, 23-year-old to be a co-founder and a youth chief of a political party tasked to take on AMNO, And what more, to build on the youth base of a new political party. But I believe in that one-year timeline, uh, for those who followed uh, my track record in Bersatu, Bersatu was indeed a youth-centered party then. 55% of the party membership were made up of those below 40 years old. And what many didn't know, the majority of party members were like me, first-time party members. I've never joined any political party before. Um, so yes, some would say age is an issue, but I believe that with the right time, track record, I'll be able to prove them wrong uh, with facts and figures. Uh, and what I lack in experience, I must make up with the level of dynamism, uh, with the ability to think out of the box and to work 10 times harder. And that's why when I was in cabinet, uh, when many ministers tried to amend the constitution and failed in one year in parliament, I was able to amend three critical uh, constitutional amendments, which have now empowered more than 5.8 million new young voters. I was able to pursue paid internships uh, in the government sector. I was able um, uh, to reduce the age of youth from 40 to 30 years old. Um, and many other things like Undi 18, like getting Malaysia through its biggest job stimulus package for young people worth 6.5 billion ringgit. Um, but sadly, it ended in 22 months. I wanted to do a lot more, especially when it comes to reforms, enacting Malaysia's first political funding act in which the Presidential Council of Pakistan Harapan empowered me to do, to do so. And we were about to table it in March 2020 into the change in government. We were on the eve of uh, pursuing our PTPTN promise on student loans. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the government changed in March 2020. That was supposed to be yep. announced. And many more, right? So to, 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 to decriminalize drug addiction, to get medical cannabis in, all of that have been agreed. Um, okay. And yep. I don't like yep. to waste time. We need to keep on turbocharging yep. forward. Okay, you mentioned uh, your work experience in Johor, and of course you are a member of parliament uh, for, 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 for MOA. Um, the Tunku Makota of Johor has called you a drama queen, and uh, he's also invited you to, uh, to jump off the top of KLCC without a parachute. What did you do to provoke such a strong reaction uh, from the royals in your own home state, and uh, does that make it difficult for you to do your job? Uh, I'm a Johorian, and uh, as a Johorian, I have great respect uh, for the royal institution, whether it's Tuanku Sultan and Duli Yamamulia Tunku Makota Johor. Uh, while there may be uh, disagreements and maybe some things which I may have said uh, to hurt him, I apologize, and to be honest, I just want to focus on building our country, our beloved country. I believe Johor should be the most developed state, especially because it's bordering Singapore and there's so much potential. It's one of the most multiracial states in Malaysia with, a, with the largest youth population. Uh, and it has so much potential. Uh, and if anything, I want to try my best to turbocharge Johor. When I campaign in MUA, I believe winning MUA uh, would unlock the key to Johor, therefore unlocking the key to Putrajaya. Um, so what has happened has happened. But to be honest, sir, I'm very focused on moving forward. Uh, I take the, the, the criticisms uh, by him very seriously. Uh, and I'll continue to try to improve myself. I remember when uh, last year in December, uh, when there were specific criticisms made, especially uh, uh, through my political service in Moa, um, instead of uh, responding negatively, I doubled the efforts. Uh, I think while being in opposition, MUA is the only constituency which has given out more than 1,200 laptops and tablets, quality laptops and tablets. We were able to subsidize the tuition fees of many students, uh, and we were able to provide more than 15,000 food baskets throughout the COVID period, more than many parliament, despite MUA being one of the only constituencies in Malaysia deprived of federal funding. Even opposition MPs today have gotten allocations, but I don't know, maybe the member of parliament more is so evil to the point that uh, the voters should be punished as well. But no regrets. 
I keep on moving forward and I do look forward to building bridges because in the end, I mean, I need, I, I want to be focused on moving Malaysia forward and I want Fair to work enough. with as many people as I can. Fair enough. Let, let me ask you something about your, your, your background. Now, you indicated a few years ago that you held some radical views, but that you've changed. Now, there's a quote, uh, and I think uh, we can put it up on the, on the, on the screen, um, in which you said, um, I am not proud of my past. Uh, I was a racist. I was a, an Islamic radical. Like, I only mingled with Muslims. People always say, oh, no, this person is a racist or a radical and cannot be changed. No, no, no. I was exactly that, but I have changed. How did you end up with such racist or Islamic radical views, to use your own words, uh, and uh, what or who influenced your thinking in, in that direction? To be honest, sir, I think everyone would have uh, their own history, and mine was not the best. I remember at one point in time, and, and, and I'm privileged to be in a family which, uh, which I'm in, my sister, um, the eldest, uh, is a professional. She's a she's a lecturer, and I remember at one point in time I had such a regressive views where I thought that being the lady in the family, she she, she should just focus uh, in being the housewife uh, and instead of being a professional, which she is today. Um, I remember I looked down on many um, people who were not born in the same skin color or religion as I am. How that perception came to being is multifactorial. Um, I, I, I don't like blaming others. Uh, I think it's a self-reflection which I need to go through. I remember at one point in time, I used to skip school many times. I wasn't the best stellar student. Eh? Um, so they're saying that's my Zaman Jahiliya, the dark days. That, it, where, that even my Ustaza in my religious school, the religious school which I went to, uh, said that one day I'll be a drug addict. Um, because I used to skip school so many times. Um, but I was lucky enough to be selected uh, to get into the Royal Military College. One thing which I have is I always believe that willpower can really turbocharge you forward. And um, that was my first barrier. I really wanted to enter the Royal Military College because I wanted to be independent. I no longer wanted to burden my family financially. I wanted to prove to my mom and my dad that I can be independent. Um, and um, I worked really hard that year, got the minimum academic requirement, six A's, two B's, and I worked ridiculously hard to build up my physical strength, IQ, EQ, to get in. And when I got in, my life truly changed because that was, was the, the, the most multi-racial. Was the yeah, RMT point for you? Definitely. It was the most multi-racial, until today, I believe it's the most multi-racial boarding school in Malaysia. And, I, uh, and it taught me discipline, diligence it introduced me to debating and public speaking um so that made me a global citizen but most importantly it made me a better person right um uh, that, that i knew that i had a role to play in building malaysia up and it imbued a strong sense of patriotism that there's something bigger than our personal interests and the military is all about giving back and having that sense of collective mindset uh, and and uh, and attitude that our lives are largely interconnected to one another, regardless of race, religion, where we are at, that when someone suffers from hardship, that suffering is felt by us as well. Um, so it made me who I am today. Uh, uh, can I ask you about your relationship with uh, uh, Tun Dr. Mahadev? Uh, when in government, you were a, a staunch uh, uh, defender and supporter uh, uh, of, of Tun. You, I think, uh, referred to him as your, your mentor. Um, uh, at one stage, you... Um, Express confidence that uh, Tun Dr. Made would hand power to uh, Dr. Sri Anwar. Um, were you surprised by the by the by the turn of events? Oh, I was definitely surprised by many things uh, because um, it came from the party which I had so much hopes in, um, and as many people would know, as it is already on record and there's a recording behind it as well, uh, that I was one of the loudest critics of the Sheraton move that out of the 30 plus Supreme Council members, I think I was the loudest critic and I even told both to Dr. Madi and Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin in a meeting that if they were to decide to put the people's mandate behind, they should count me out. Um, because 
a move of political convenience for power, popularity, money will never get our party far because once you betray the people, the people will never forgive you and generations to come will lose faith in our democratic system. Now, you, um, you, 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 you uh, uh, criticised quite strongly Tan Sri Muyudin, uh, but you've been rather silent on the role that Tun Dr. Mahathir played in the collapse of the Pakatan Harapan uh, government. You care to, uh, uh, to talk about that? Allow me to share. I'll try my best to summarize because it will be much longer if I were yes, to explain please. the whole story. Um, on Sunday, when Bersatu decided to leave Pakatan Harapan, and myself, Tun, Datuk Sri Mukris, Ulia, Akram, a few others, uh, Datuk Khadija, I think only six or seven of us uh, really wanted the opposite. And we were outvoted. Immediately after that, I um received a call that very day that all of us must go to Sheraton under the instruction of Tun Dr. Mahadi Muhammad. I remember I was shocked because in a meeting Tun Dr. Mahadi opposed it. And this is recorded, it's minuted. So what I did then, instead of giving up, I decided to go to visit Tun Dr. Mahadi personally at his house. And this was about Maghrib, it's about 7 p.m. and the meeting was supposed to be at 8 p.m. And for proof, I brought Datuk Rina Harun, the Ketua Sri Kandi of Bersatu. And to our surprise then, Tun was shocked that there is even a meeting that night and told both of us that he disagreed and that we must go to the meeting and tell everyone that Tun is not informed of this meeting and disagrees with what's going on. Immediately after, when I went to the meeting, I told Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin, I told the other MPs, they were obviously shocked and unhappy with what I said. And then I contacted opposition leaders. I remember contacting Datuk Sri Anwar, I contacted Lim Guan Eng, I contacted Abang Mat and I told them, please go and see to Dr. Mahadi the next morning. And I uh, encouraged them and they did go to see Tun. And there was a teary conversation where Tun mentioned that he can't take this anymore. He has lost support of the party and that he will step down. Fast forward then, they were, obviously, my, my, my party was in haywire. But I never gave up on Pakatan Harapan. And up until... One week after, which is on a Friday, I brought Pakatan Harapan leaders to see to Dr. Mahdi to find that middle ground. But unfortunately, we, I mean, one thing led to another and Agong decided to support so, uh, so, so the you're saying that, of Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin. So you're, you're saying that uh, Tun Dr. Mahdi had no hand in the whole Sheraton move and in working to bring down his own government? I think everyone has end in this, including myself, including, I mean, I feel personally responsible because I built this party. I mean, we built this party. I was a co-founder. I really thought that Basatu will be the party to reform the minds of the Malay community and bring the reforms in Malaysia, which will be intergenerational. So obviously it caught everyone by surprise where Tun Dr. Mahadeh stepped down and I believe you have to ask him, I believe you will be interviewing him, why he stepped down. It caught all of us by surprise. Uh, if you ask me, I believe he should not have stepped down. He should have fought on. He was still the sitting Prime Minister with the support of the majority of MPs. While the party may have withdrawn support, but he is still the sitting Prime Minister and the majority of MPs are still supportive of him. Um, but that's a different academic discussion. But what I want to look forward to, sir, it's really how do we ensure that mistakes like this never ever happens again? Where you only rely on personality clashes between a few people at the top or where there could be a democratic transition uh, via power struggles where people jump from one party to another. And that's why I keep on stressing, what did we learn? We must learn from what happened in Charitan, right? Where we need an overhaul of our democratic system because if we only pinpoint one, two, three people. It will never do justice. So if you ask me, Basatu should be responsible, I should be responsible, Tun Dr. Made, Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin. We should be responsible as a coalition, right? Where the Rakyat gave so much hope to us in 2018. And I believe we should have turbocharged those reforms. And I'm responsible because I'm part of that collective cabinet. Um, Thank you. And I'm you doing know, my I... best in Muda to reset Malaysia. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to apologize in advance because I've got so many questions. So many questions are coming in and 
uh, one of the, 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 the questions that is coming in right now, in fact, there have been so many of it on this particular subject, the Zake Naik uh, uh, issue, as you remember, it created uh, quite a stir. And when he made those unfortunate remarks, you came up with a statement uh, that read uh, an attack against, and I think we have it up on the screen too, uh, an attack against our Chinese and Indian brothers and sisters is an attack against all Malaysians. It's ridiculous to think that uh, that my fellow Malaysians are my tatamu or guest. They are my family, for God's sake. Enough is enough. And then you backtracked. You had that uh, famous or infamous dinner with him, and you were taking the selfie with smiling, and uh, it was all forgive and forget. Now, Dato Ambiga, uh, who was one of your strongest supporters, uh, issued a statement that read something like this. This does not heal. Your first instincts were right. This is a capitulation by you, so we don't need the drivel about apologies, etc., etc. You are one of my favorite ministers, and this is disappointing. Now, your uh, detractors charged that you buckled under pressure, abandoned the high moral ground uh, uh, that you first staked out, and played to the gallery instead of sticking to your principles. Now, one questioner specifically said this. Said Sadiq brands himself as a strong, principled politician and leader, someone who is willing to speak truth to power. In the light of the Zakir Naik affair, why should people trust that you would be any more principled than the rest of your fellow politicians? Personally, I'm disappointed with myself as well, especially then. Allow me to try my best to summarize the whole event. Uh, and you can ask my cabinet colleagues of what happened too. When the issue of Zaki Nai uh, mislabeling my Indian and Chinese brothers and sisters as pendatang, I immediately brought it up in cabinet. And I think I was the first minister to bring this up in cabinet as well, together with uh, YBM Gobin. And I did demand for accountability and action. Then cabinet decided that action should be taken. And I defended that view. Immediately after, there was a discussion where should Zaki Naik be sent off. The fear of cabinet is that if he was sent off to India, in which there's possibility of persecution, and that if anything went wrong, there will be havoc in Malaysia. And I believe if you remember the exact moment, there were protests and counter protests run by different communities in Little India Street. I, think, I remember it was a Saturday, there were supposed to be two protests by the Indian community and by the Malay Muslim community, which was so politically charged. And I believe any uh, Malaysian could predict what would happen when two reactionary groups meet up with one another in a tight space. I remember myself, Kit Siang and Chin Tong. If you read Kit Siang's book, uh, he, he spoke about this. We went to see Tun Dr. Mahdi on a Friday after Friday prayers to talk about this, saying that there must be action and we must be strategic in moving this action. Uh, Tun Dr. Mahdi agreed. The next discussion was which country? UAE said no, Saudi said no, almost every country said no. Then came Saturday, it's either Saturday or Sunday, where the protests were about to take place. What should be done? Then I remember saying, okay, we have to calm the situation down and I was tasked to speak to Zaki Knight to ensure that there's a get order. Why you? No longer speak. Because at that point in time, I think I was the most vocal one against, and it was me, Kit Siang, and Chin Tong who went to see to Dr. Mahdi as well. Remember, it was after Friday prayers at Yasan al Buhari. And then I believe, I, I think there was another group who were tasked to speak to the Indian community to ensure that they won't go out to protest as well. Where did I go wrong? What I definitely regretted doing. I don't think I should have I should have paraded that meeting. If anything, the get order was imposed. And until today, the get order is still on. That's where Dr. Zakina has not commented. To be fair, he has not commented at all about politics and on interfaith, the differences until today. Uh, after that discussion, and I believe diplomacy is the way forward. But why I truly regret, I should have posted it as if everything was fine. And I still firmly stand by the principle that an attack against my Chinese and Indian brothers is an attack against Malaysia. Do you think it's an, it's, it's an attack against all of us? 
Do you think he Pardon? should be deported? Do you think he should be deported? Definitely, I think action should be taken. But today, when the get order has been placed, and we haven't heard any issues about it, I just want you to think, think of the alternative. What could have happened? Which a lot of people, I, I, I think, do not... Um, Imagine on a Saturday or Sunday, two groups, racially charged, pissed off, exasperated, meeting Little India, which could potentially be a very tense point, which may lead to a larger conflict. So I think we should definitely find a way to de-escalate. But what I still hold to today, accountability must still be taken. Um, and I personally take full responsibility in the words which I used after in parading the meeting, which I believe was a lapse of judgment for myself. And I apologize. I think Dato Ambiga was absolutely correct. I think the disappointment shed was correct. And I apologize for that. Um, diplomacy is important, but I don't think I should have been a lot more tactful and clear in the way how I want to deal with that conflict instead of parading it as if it was a success. The Thank attack you. on my fellow Malaysians was indeed hurtful, and I must have hurt them, and I apologize. Thank you. Uh, let me move on to some current issues now. Uh, as you know, there's, there's growing concern about uh, what is often called creeping Islamization. There have recently there have been controversy over uh, alcohol curbs, banning of 4Ds, there's constant complaint of uh, dress code, uh, imposition of dress codes, uh, there's some disrespect for temples, the restrictions on Taipusam, uh, and uh, there's a growing sense, uh, especially coming from the questions that I've received, that uh, the Islamic authorities are increasingly dismissive uh, of non-Muslim rights. And then, of course, there's the issue of RU355 and what that means uh, for non-Muslims. How concerned are you about the slide towards an Islamic state replete with Sharia law as the primary law of the land? Do not blame Muslims or Islam. Blame those who masquerade Islam for their own personal interest, purpose, and in wanting to divide Malaysia forever. Why do I say this? It's not about Islam. It's about hypocrisy, the biggest hypocrisy in Malaysia. Allow me to comment one by one, right? As to what you just mentioned. So let's look at the Timah issue. It was debated for two damn weeks in parliament, but yet the very same people who made this issue a national issue did not comment at all about the 100 million ringgit land awarded by government to the former prime minister. Zip, zero, right? They didn't speak as passionately about the 800,000 Malaysians who were unemployed. They didn't care about more than 25,000 Malaysians who died out of COVID. I mean, the level of focus they gave to this name was so much more important than, than, than anything else. To me, this is them hiding their failures to govern and by making this uh, a lightning rod for them to be the so-called champion of Muslims. Second, and this is the part which I really do understand. Second one, you know about the ban on liquor uh, for Chinese medical shops and the sundry shops, convenience stores. Just, just follow me for a bit. The argument they use because they want to stop drink driving and also the alcohol-related accidents. This is the biggest hypocrisy here. They only put ban on hard liquor for convenience store and the small Chinese medical shop, which, mind you, they must already lock the alcohol segment by 9 p.m. But all the big outlets can still open until 12 o'clock. You can still visit a pub right until 12 o'clock you can still operate but the small guys i'm sorry you guys have to close down you guys can't even sell at all despite the fact that there are already strict regulations today and let's be frank that's why i say we need to make decisions based on data and science do you really think if a person wants to do drink driving they'll buy that alcohol at 6 or 7 pm at the 7-eleven i mean seriously Drink driving often happens after 12 when they drink at pubs, clubs until late night, uncontrolled. So look at the data and signs. And it's ironic that they allow the big players to operate and sell until 11 p.m. and 12 midnight. But the small guys, Chinese medical stores, I'm sorry, 
you guys have to close and you can't sell at all. And mind you, beer can still be sold. So I mean, where is the logical consistency in this, right? They always protect the big guys, but the small guys, they tekan to the max. So the reason why I want to comment what, so one final one, about, oh, Kedah State Government. Yeah, we ban uh, 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 4D, we ban lottery. Again, please look at the data. They ban it. You know who are the biggest winners? Those who operate illegally, right? They are the, they are the happiest people now because now they can operate unfettered. They no longer have the legal competitors. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Look at those online gambling, the illegal ones huh, who are operating. I'm pretty sure you must have gotten the SMS, the WhatsApp, the Telegram messages of how to join. And data, data has proven that once you suppress legal gambling, the illegal gambling industry thrives, thrives to the max. Not only are they not taxed, they're not regulated. Those who should not visit the miners, they target the miners. The money and the profits they reap in the end are not even kept in Malaysia or are used to fund the illicit drug industries, prostitution and many more. But again, people must see, look at the data and science behind this. Don't just look, oh, bagus lah, kedah state government, oh, Muslim, very good. But in reality, they are the ones, right, who are, who are really enriching the black market, hurting Malaysians and hurting those who actually want to operate within the legal framework. So that's, I, I cannot understand this hypocrisy. And, and I'm sorry, just to comment on why they say Kedah do this, but the same past government who's part of cabinet, so they're part of cabinet on the federal level, triple the amount of special draw gambling. I mean, I, I cannot understand hypocrisy and logical inconsistency. But this is why I say Muda and many other parties, don't be afraid. Don't try to so-called out islamize them. We are Muslims. Don't be apologetic. We fight based on data and science, they are the ones who are hurting Malaysia. They are the ones who are hurting Muslims, the miners who are being taken in by this Ill illegal gambling trade. They are the ones protecting the big guys, but hurting the small guys, the small sundry shops, Chinese medical stores. Fight them with facts and figures. Never pander to them, but confront them with facts and figures. We can win this fight together. Will you vote for RU355 if it comes to the floor of parliament? No. And uh, I think I'm one of the few Malay Muslim MPs, even before I became an MP, you can check my statement now, I believe it was in 2017, where I wrote a really long article against RU355. Same, same reason, right? The hypocrisy and double standards will, will hurt my community the most. Let's face it, right? Look at where all the rates are taking place. Do you think it affects the elite? No, they get scot-free. Look at what happened the double standardness when it comes to COVID, uh, COVID laws. Can you imagine if it is applied this way, a person will get a small guy, poor guy, underprivileged, single family, broken family will get his or her hands get chopped off. But those who are rich and powerful now are being treated as VIPs and almost awarded a hundred million ringgit land. If that's not double standard and the hypocrisy of the system, can you imagine what will happen when the law is implemented? So. We need to ask these people, right, the, the elites who choose to divide us, right, who, who, who use race and religion to defend themselves, to entrench their power, but hurt the DNA of Malaysia. If there are already immense double standard to give, what did you do to fight corruption? What did you do when a convict almost got 100 million ringgit land and then suddenly now you say, don't worry, guys, the law will be applied equally while the small guys are thrown to prison and now we'll have their limbs cut off. Let's be fair and honest in this assessment. Look at facts and figures and talk about this transparently in a conciliatory manner. I'm not here to demonize you or to demonize your belief. I'm here to work with you to build a developed country together. Can I ask you about, uh, about uh, uh, Noor Sajat, uh, the transgender who had to flee to Australia to find a refuge? As you know, she, she claimed uh, harassment and humiliation by the authorities and a number of groups that have spoken out. Well, what's your position uh, on, on, on the whole uh, issue of uh, uh, LGBT rights and on the, on the persecution that Noor Sajjad uh, claims that she suffered? I believe the best way to look at where I stand on is to look at my track record in the past. Again, in 2017, I remember there was a very big issue. Uh, 
let's not because if you just look at nostalgia you look at individuals and there'll be a lot of cases let's look at the transgender community overall in 2017 there was this very big uh issue about um this transgender uh who sold nasi lemak by the side of the road and branded it that way and there was so much furor to the point that people were wanted to punish her take her off and i came out to defend uh, to, 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 to defend her because in the end we are humans it's a basic principle of humanity if we always go in to punish instead of educating instead of treating them with compassion we will never be able right, Wait a minute. So, to show so that Islam that is a religion of educated? compassion is that what you're saying that she should be educated what I'm saying is that in the end, the best way to deal with individual cases like this is with compassion and not punishment. And the best case in point, and again, look at the facts and figures. One, the more you punish them and treat them as outcasts, the more they are forced. For example, one of the biggest pro problems the transgender community is not that they're asking for the world. They just want a dignified life. They want access to good jobs and not discriminated for it. But if you keep on discriminating them, pushing them to the corners of society, that's where they are forced to sell their bodies, to sell their soul. And does that make us better Muslims through our actions of punishing them instead of using compassion? I'll show one simple example. Look at how Dr. Zul, the former Mufti of Wilaya, approached them, met up with them, right? Used compassion instead of imprisoning them, pushing them out of the country. So I think the best way is to find that common ground. To say that Malaysia must go either on extreme ends is tough. But the least, the least that we can do, and what I believe sincerely, is that we need to provide them a dignified way of life, access to jobs, so that in the end, they can live together with us. Similarly, how they've lived with us for decades, but only now being made a very big issue. Uh, let me come to the, uh, let me talk about the issue of, of, of corruption. In July, uh, you were charged with two counts of criminal breach of trust and one count of uh, misappropriating uh, party funds. Uh, you claimed it was uh, uh, politically motivated. Uh, of course, every time politicians are charged with corruption, they always claim it's politically motivated. What makes your case? So I've got two questions here. What and very quickly, I mean the time is going by so fast. What makes your case different? And is the MACC being weaponized and used against certain individuals for political purposes? Three points. One, just look at the facts of the case. It's vastly different than any other cases. Why? They went contract by contract to see every single contract I tended up when I was a minister. They couldn't find a single cent, which I misappropriated and abuse of power when I was in, when I was in government. Nothing. What they went after me on was a fundraising which I did before election. I wasn't an MP. I wasn't a cabinet minister. And the allegation is not that, you know, the money went missing, but was that it was a party fundraiser and not Said Sadiq's fundraiser. That's it. There was one. The other claim was that, again, nothing to do with my position as a YB, as a minister, as an MP, was after Sheraton. After Sheraton, there was a withdrawal of party funds. And every single cent is accounted for. So if you read the exact um, charge, nothing to do about the money going missing. Every single cent is accounted for. But they said, oh, you didn't get the approval of the Supreme Council, despite the fact that Armada knows about it, that the leaders know about it, and that every single cent is accounted for. So it didn't go missing. I didn't abuse it. So just look at that fact first. And may I remind everyone, that the same party which ended up right really begging me to come back to them are the ones who brought up these charges the party who expelled me for not wanting to support the prime minister who put behind the people's mandate so really if anything they would try their best to to get me on board but when i didn't it came true and, and the fact that in court it's already been reported the charge sheet or the charge order was given one year and a half ago or more than one year already and they didn't charge they postponed it postponed it postponed it and that's where they kept on threatening me threatening me come join us if not this will happen 
I will never ever bow down to these threats by these cowards who want to destroy my country. I've not bowed down to the threats which I fa faced before elections. I'll never kowtow to them. And I look forward to having my day in court because, sir, this moves back to your second question. Is MACC being weaponized? I have concrete and solid evidence to show and tender in court. And I look forward to have my day in court because Tan Sri Mudin Yassin will have to be a witness. Datuk Sri Azmin Ali will have to be a witness. Many others in my party will have to be a witness. Tun Dr. Mahade and many others have already said that they will be witnesses in my case because I will want to show how corrupt the system is from the top to bottom. But the purpose of this expose is not meant to pull Malaysia downward, but my interest is to ensure that genuine reforms come about, that in the end, the truth will unshackle Malaysian institutions and there will be strong voices of changes to turbocharge our institutions forward. Can I ask you about the, the new economic policy? As you know, there's been a lot of unhappiness both with the policy and the implementation. Uh, there have been growing calls from several uh, renowned Malaysian economists and business people uh, to shift uh, uh, from a race-based to a needs-based approach uh, to help all irrespective uh, of, of race. What are your thoughts about uh, the NAP? Has it outlived its purpose? Do we need to move to a, a needs-based approach? So this is where I always stress what MUDA stands for. We want a data policy-driven decision-making process. So let's look at the origin of NEP post-69. It was not meant to enrich specific individuals. It was meant to alleviate poverty among all races. And all races is a very performative word. And that's when FELDA, FELCRA, MARA, and many other institutions were formed. That's where a lot of scholarships were given out. That it was meant to deal with poverty alleviation among all races. And it was also meant to be reviewed. Why is the reviewal process important? Because it shows that it is not a rights-based issue, but it was a policy improvement, right? So when there is a timeline after 15 years, it's meant to be reviewed. Therefore, we should have reviewed and looked where, or what, what we did went right and what went wrong. For example, where it went right previously, uh, in terms of the professional class, doctors, uh, accountants, engineers, architects, I think Mother Malays was woefully underrepresented. But then after scholarships and education as a leveling factor was given, there was a huge increase. So there were some good parts. Where did we go wrong? Right? When you start making it an issue of ketuanan instead of a policy reform, then it becomes it falls in the line of entitlement instead of helping underprivileged communities who generally need it, regardless of race and religion. Two. When it is perpetual, it's meant it, it will it opens up so many areas of abuse. That's where, instead of, for example, giving Mara, saya anak Mara, I am a Mara scholar, and I owe my 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 education life to Mara, and I will defend Mara as an institution which is meant to provide scholarships to the poor and underprivileged, right? And what pisses me off is that if you read the track record of Mara. In the end, instead of focusing on helping underprivileged, especially Malays when it comes to education, then they started giving out multi-million dollar contracts, bailing out companies, uh, giving huge deals in Australia, right, which cost millions of dollars and wastage of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money instead of that money being used to help the underprivileged in the rural centres of Malaysia, Sabah, Sarawak and many others. So what's the case I'm trying to make here? Learn from where from what went wrong. There are good parts which should be maintained and bad parts which should definitely be changed. So what I'm advocating for is a, is a mixture. Why do I say this? The current NEP on its own must be reformed. Look at Sabah and Sarawak, right? The fact that after decades of NEP and the implementation of NEP, that a quarter of Bumi Putra Sabahan still live below poverty line is a great indicator of its failure. However, we shouldn't immediately move to the knee-jerk policy by removing Mara, Felda, Felkra. I don't think even if you ask middle class, Chinese, Indians, oh, that we should remove Mara, Felda, Felkra, they won't say that. What do they want? They just want to be treated equitably, right? They want to ensure 
that if there is a Chinese student who is born in an underprivileged family, that they too will get the scholarship. They too will get a place in university. And I'm all for that, right? And I'm all for a way in which we no longer protect the Malay elites from getting this multi-billion dollar contract, which in the end, as what has been proven in parliament recently, they get this 400 million, 300 million ringgit contract, 700 million contract, and then they delegate it. I mean, immediately they get it. Direct nego, no open tender, or oh, because it's the Bumi Putra. And then they sell it off to a Chinese company. I mean, <laughs> and they take, I mean, really, it's keuntungan atas angin. And seriously, how does that help the underprivileged children, Malay, Chinese, Indian, who are suffering, right? How does that help them? So the argument I'm trying to make, it must be policy driven, it must be data driven, so and it must be sector driven, right? So education, it must be a policy here. When it comes to an uh, economic well-being, when it comes to entrepreneurship, so there, it must be targeted. I have one so question. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, um, why didn't your government do something to review the NEP when you were in power? Very so, quickly, because I've got a lot of questions coming in. 22 months, I believe we should have done a lot more. It's hard for me to comment on issues which were beyond my portfolio. But what I could say, which were within my control, at least I owe direct responsibility to it, in a Ministry of Youth and Sports, um, I think we had the most diverse uh, leadership ever. We were run by strong women. I think we, we had most the most number of women represented in the top leadership. Uh, we had... Uh, a Malaysian Indian as a KSU. In terms of contract giving, it was all done via open tender. I told my leadership, you should not judge whether they are Malay, Chinese or Indian. If they deserve it, they should get it. And that policy was made the policy of the ministry. Uh, and even when it comes to appointments, it should be that way. That's where it was a very diverse ministry in terms of its leadership structure. From a cabinet position, when, when discussions on education came up, we did defend. I'll show some changes which took place. Let's look at MRSM. So there were traditional quotas given, but what we focused on is on alleviating the B40. We said they should be given priority, and the priority is not B, it's B40, no matter who you are. That's the example. Mara, and this, this is where I'm truly pissed off, right? Because Sayan Amara. The Mara board, and they were made up, if you look at the Mara board on the PH side, it was made of amazing people. These were like graduates of Oxford and Cambridge who have worked in, in top companies, banks, people like Ami Maidin who have set up, who is one of the most successful Malay entrepreneurs on his own regards. People like Nongsari, people like, I mean, they, they were amazing people. And they already came up with their plan of reforms to focus on education, to focus on the underprivileged, to stop subsidizing the so-called economic elites to give up contracts, multi-million dollar contract to elite, but focus on education, to start up a trust fund behind it. So it's a, it was about to be implemented, right? And um, I remember there was so much pushback then, uh, but I defended that move. I said, it's good. I'm a Mara scholar, I will defend it. And the change in government happened. They removed all of them. And these were not, these were not politically charged people, right? These are professionals. These are successful entrepreneurs who were removed and replaced by all politicians, by, 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 a lot of them are politicians now, and the whole plan was shelved. So can I, can I, um, again, you know, I, uh, as I say, my apologies for, for for interrupting you so much. But there's so much coming in. Um, you you uh, have put a lot of faith in the young people of Malaysia. You talk about inspiring and mobilizing the young people, and of course, Undi 18 is going to bring, as you mentioned, 5.8 million new voters. Um, do you do you believe that the young people in Malaysia will rise to the challenge? What makes you think they are even politically engaged, given how jaded Malaysians are in in general uh, about politics? And will they follow you? Whether they follow me or not is their choice, and it is my responsibility to prove them that I'm worth their vote. Right. So I think the days where politicians feel entitled, thinking that they must support because the other side. It's bad, it's over. The lesser of evils is over. We should rise to be better. So it's a comparison of winners instead of a comparison of failures. And I'll try my best uh, uh, to win their hearts and minds. The other part of the question is, I remain optimistic of Malaysia because of the youth populace. Some may say that they are jaded, apathetic, they do not care, they are disgusted. It is good that they feel 
a form of, of disgust, that they feel angry because it shows that they care, sir, that they want to be a part of Malaysia, that they want to work hard to ensure that we can build a future together. And yes, that anger may be targeted on all sides, but that means that we need to rise to the occasion and be better. The fact that discussions now, I mean, are everywhere, social media, coffee talks, the fact that even politics today has been a part of pop culture indicates that everyone is talking about it, right? That even superstars in, in, like, in like the entertainment industry are making fun of politicians, talking about them, are criticizing them. I think that's great because it shows that they are so in tune and they know what's going on. And, and don't, 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 don't get politics wrong when people think, oh, you must know in and out of politics every single thing. The fact that people are talking about the increasing cost of living, their jobs, employment opportunities, whether they want to move out or move in of Malaysia, this shows that they care so dearfully and that we politicians from all sides should work hard to ensure that they remain hopeful of Malaysia no matter who wins. Can, I, can, I, pick up on that? can I pick up on that? Now, one, uh, a lot of questions that came in from young people uh, to you was, um, uh, they're all concerned. They, they don't like what's happening in the country. They are disappointed with the corruption, the, the racism, the religious extremism. The question they are asking is, what can they do? What advice will you give them? Remember that anger, disappointment, feeling of disgust. And my hope is that you convert that negative energy into that positive force to keep on pushing boundaries to change Malaysia. And don't think changing Malaysia is only about joining politics or political party. It's not. It's about caring, talking to your family members, to your friends, to your office mates about what's going on. It's about turning up when your right to vote comes. It's about volunteering in helping underprivileged communities so that they have a place in our beloved Malaysia. So everyone has a role to play in their own respective ways. And my hope is that you will not lose hope in Malaysia. You may lose hope in us politicians, I understand. And we are responsible in winning your hope. We cannot force you to stay. It is your right to vote with your feet. But it is my duty as well, and it's my objective to fight for your interests and your right to remain hopeful in Malaysia so that in the end you don't vote with your feet. Just to share one small personal experience. It's quite personal to me. After election, um, without getting permission of cabinet and the prime minister, um, I flew to Hong Kong um, to meet up with Sir Robert Kwok, who I believe is a true Malaysian patriot one of the most successful Malaysian ent entrepreneurs since independence. And when I met up with him, it's not meant to talk about contracts and stuff. I had one clear goal. I wanted to convince him to come back to Malaysia and to go big in Malaysia. Because it's someone like him who left Malaysia. If you read his book, I've read his book many times, due to many problems which he had in Malaysia, and I truly empathize with the problems which he faced. And I feel really sorry for what he had to go through and to move to China, Hong Kong, to build a huge business empire recognized globally. If he could come back to, sh to Malaysia to show that, see, this is the new Malaysia, I think that will signal to the m hundreds of thousands of successful Malaysian diaspora out there that Malaysia is back, that this is your Malaysia as it is ours. And I remember he was so hopeful and then we were exchanging letters with one another and as someone who I respect so much. And then when there were policy inconsistencies, when there were fights here and then, when government went in the wrong direction, I felt personally responsible because I was trying my best to sell that hope of a new Malaysia, Malaysia Baru. So I still remember that, that day and that sense of responsibility, and I hold it up to today, when I fought Muda, what I cannot change in the past, I want to change for a better future. Okay, so, I have two more questions before I, I, I move uh, to, to, to the questions that are, uh, are piling up. 
Now, you have been touted as a future prime minister. You're an up-and-coming politician with a huge following, what, 750,000 uh, followers on, on Facebook or YouTube. What are your ambitions? Do you want to be prime minister one day? Sir, one thing which I've learned about Malaysian politics, those who uh, fix the dream or intention to become the prime minister often will not reach there. And I'm not, I'm not singling out anyone. And I really mean it. To me, whether it works or not, if it does, if you read, if you become a minister, if you become high the minister, thank God. But hopefully you will use that position for the greater good. But if you remain focused on reaching those goals, and those goals, it's not, I mean, you, 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 there are many other ways for you to reach that goal even without becoming the prime minister, right? Um, but if you focus on making Malaysia a developed country, a country which is governed with integrity and dignity, a country which is governed via compassion instead of punishment, a country which, even if you change government 10 times, but the systems of democracy are so strong that it could overcome any challenges, then I think it's great. And even if I don't become prime minister, great because the Malaysia which I want to see is already taking place. Why do I share this particular anecdote? Because if Kairi Jamaluddin could do it, I will support him. If Nurul Izzah could do it, I will support her. If Dato Sri Shafi and Dr. Zul could do it, I will support them. It cannot just be about a personality. It must be a team, a movement of people who share principles and beliefs to achieve that. Because in the end, if we, let's say if you fix the need, oh, I want to become Prime Minister, Prime Minister, what if suddenly, you are offered to become Prime Minister, but you have to sacrifice your principles of a dream of a united, prosperous and developed Malaysia. Will you take it? So, there's a tough line. I wouldn't. Right? So, it shouldn't be... I, I've witnessed how my party, I'm sorry, I, for my ex-party, Bersatu, did that, right? So, it should be... <laughs> yes, the road may be long, but make it worth it. And if we fail to achieve that goal, then the future generation will come forward to, to, to take on that mantle, can do it, but we need to support them. When, when people think of Syed Sadiq, they, they think of the debating champion, champion, they think of the youngest cabinet minister, they think of Zakir Naik, they think of uh, you, uh, uh, Dr. Mahathir's acolyte. How would you like Malaysians to see you? As a civil servant. When I say a civil servant, someone who works for Malaysia, for all Malaysians, and I've set my mind to dedicate my life to Malaysia. And if politics does not work out, the world doesn't end, but I want to be a civil servant. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a lecturer. I want to serve different communities in Malaysia. And in, in the end, I don't want them to just see me Syed Sadiq as a politician, because to me, there is a life outside of politics. But I do want to serve my life to Malaysia and I've set my life in making Malaysia a developed country. And Thank a developed you. country which provides <laughs> good quality of jobs, a great education system, which could be the bastion of democratic hope for Southeast Asia, to really provide a dignified way of living for all Malaysians. And I'm set in making Malaysia a developed country. Thank you. Okay, let me take some questions now. Uh, the first question, Kiran from KL asked, if you became the Minister of Education, what would your prior priorities be? Um, in Indonesia, the, the education minister, who is also the co-founder of Gojak, uh, formulated and is ex executing a breakthrough education policy that will profoundly transform Indonesia. I, I guess the question is, what kind of education reform we, we, we need here in Malaysia? Quick, quick, uh, personal anecdote. Saudara Nadim Makarim, the minister of education of Indonesia, is a great guy, even greater friend. Um, before he became minister, when I visited Indonesia the first time, I met up with Bapak Jokowi. Bapak Jokowi told me, because he was about to face his presidential election, that he was amazed with how our prime minister could give a chance to someone young to be in cabinet. And he told me then, this was even before the presidential election, that if he were to win, he'd like to emulate that. Then they were emulating us in Malaysia. And after he won, uh, he decided to appoint Nadim Makarib into a super ministry, education, innovation,
higher education, entrepreneurship was a combination of many ministries for him to lead. And before he was appointed, he came over to Malaysia. Uh, I brought him to see to Dr. Mahadi and he mentioned this even before the formal appointment was made. And then the sad part is now we are trailing Indonesia. Um, so to me, that, that just shows a level of regression, but there's still hope for Malaysia. What do I want to change? It will be a long list of things, but allow me uh, to try my best to summarize. One is, I believe, in a decentralized education system. What do I mean by this? Look at how Sarawak could have so many good English schools and have experimented with English schools and implementation with UEC and how it could be successful in their own ways. Why am I arguing for decentralization of education? The days in which government says that they know all at the top is over. And experimentation of different education models could provide useful data and success models which could then be replicated in other states. And this has been done in many countries. Find the best one and then you could try find a way to implement it on a federal level. That's one. Two, I believe that we should focus on math, science and English a lot more. And yes, there must be necessary trade-offs which must be made. And that's why I've, we see so much brickbats when I say that we should sh shorten our university time instead of the six years to four years uh, and cut out the unnecessary subject of kenegaraan, you know, the kawat kaki, titas. And people say, oh my God, you want to remove religious subjects. You want to remove all the patriotic subjects. I mean, if you still don't understand your country and your religion and your language when you are 21, 22, 23, that signals a greater failure of our early education system. But I want them to focus on their passion when they are, when they are in university. Don't force them, if you are an engineer, to take kawat kaki, to take kenegaraan, memasa. I mean, seriously, right? they are adults. Allow them to pursue their passion, to take the subjects which are related to their level of employment. Allow them to graduate early so that they can get valuable working experience. How could we compete? With our stop talking about competing for Oxford and Cambridge, how can we compete with Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, when their graduates have graduated earlier, one or two years than our graduates? And yet, even we graduate later, we have more student debt. Above and beyond that, we take up more uh, contact hours. You have to study from day in and day out, morning to night, weekends, where they can't pursue their passion, engage in critical thinking. And that's only universities haven't start in primary and secondary education, right? The point I'm trying to make, it will be a very long lecture, but I feel very passionate about this because I come from a family of, of, of teachers. I was a part-time lecturer myself and I love teaching so much. It's the most noble job in Malaysia, more than being a politician. But we need a system overhaul. We need a system overhaul. We cannot make cosmetic changes. I want to see that digital transformation of education. I want to see more focus on math, science and English. I want to ensure that employability, critical thinking, pursuing your passion becomes a way in which we guide education forward. And I want to ensure that in the end, we are as competitive, if not more competitive than our peers. We deserve better. I, I, I have a question from um, Dennis from Perth, Australia. He says, the vast majority of Malaysians who have emigrated have done so because of racist policies. Can Malaysia ever become a country that transcends racial politics and the damage its policies have inflicted on our society? Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, and I hope all is well there in Perth. I cannot sell you, um, you know, beautiful roses, rosy, rose-tinted Malaysia uh, today. But what I do believe, and the reason I'm still optimistic of our beloved country, is because I see a great awakening among the people. And a great awakening will create a huge wave which will change the way we run businesses, politics, and race-based politics in Malaysia. Um, and it's not driven by the political elite. It's not driven by establishment politics, but it's truly driven by the people. So will there be a day where we transcend racial politics? Yes. Is it today? Not yet. But Malaysia, like many other countries, is a work in progress. If we feel strongly in building that Malaysian dream, we should work hard together as a unified entity to keep on pushing the boundaries forward. And inevitably, there will be mistakes made. I've made many mistakes in my life as a politician and outside of politics. And I try my best to improve myself as every day passes by. But I hope that we will never lose hope 
in reaching that Malaysian dream to build a developed country, to build a country for all Malaysians. Thank you. Oh, um, one question that came in was uh, Amri Chemat, Raymond Ko, Joshua Hilme, and his wife Ruth have been missing for over five years. Uh, what have you done, if any, uh, to help their families find closure? If anything, a decision made in cabinet is a collective decision. And I believe these issues have, have been raised up many times and will fall under the purview of the Minister of Home Affairs to investigate and to respond. And I believe the IGP of Malaysia then has responded as well. Are the responses adequate? Of course not. Um, if there's anything which I could do then, especially with Youth and Sports Minister, is merely to discuss about it or to bring it up. Um, but to force away outside my portfolio was quite tough. Um, but it's the least I could do then. But I hope that there will be closure from this, especially now that's already in court. Um, some are out of court, don't, some are already in court. Don't, don't you think that every politician should be outraged that four or five Malaysians have disappeared? Uh, don't you think that every politician should be completely outraged and should take a strong position demanding that justice be done? Correct. And that's why I always like to talk about policy reforms, right? That outreach must be channeled into demanding government to implement the IPCMC. Because in the end, that's the root cause, right? When there's no accountability and transparency, and in the end, that level of uncertainty hurts the families and victims. And I've gone on record when I was in government, a huge proponent, out of government, a huge proponent as well. It was supposed to be implemented second quarter in 2020 it was already set a cabinet decision made um and it's already on record change in government everything shelved and now postponed the reason i keep on stressing on anger leading to policy reforms is that my fear there will be many more raymond course there'll be many more and there will be many more ghana passes until genuine institutional reform comes via transparency and policy change. And that's where I'm a huge advocate of the IPCMC. There must be accountability and transparency to ensure that there is closure for victims of the past, today, and tomorrow. Thank you. Um, John from KL asked this question. How do we promote integrity in politics, especially among the youth? The best way, if you ask me, I mean, sounds very, I, I like to talk about policy. I always believe that in the end, with strong institutions, integrity will be inbuilt in the hearts and minds of young people. When you have strong institutions, like an independent MACC, an independent Auditor General, an independent Attorney General, a strong police system, enforcement agencies which are incorruptible, young people themselves will know that integrity has been normalized. They don't see the political elites profiteering from huge contracts at their expense. And they know that out of example, that this is the way how Malaysia should be governed. We have to ask ourselves how countries like Singapore could deal with widespread corruption to the point that they know that their country known uh, zero, zero tolerance when it comes to corruption. It's how you normalize it. You have a strong system from top to bottom. And that's what we need in Malaysia. So it's not just singling out young people, but it's to bring a strong system, is to normalize the culture of integrity from top to bottom, so that anyone who even talks about corruption will be sidelined, pushed aside, and those who even think of accepting corruption will be so afraid because they know that their neck is on the line. Thank you. Um, uh, here's another question. Um, you complained a lot about the outrageous salaries and benefits that politicians receive. And this questioner wants to know, will you lead by example on this issue? Yes, I agree. Two points to make. First is leading by example, what have I done? When we were part of cabinet, we pushed for the salary of ministers to be cut immediately. And it was cut by 10%. Second, for the existing privileges, there were a lot which were awarded to me, but I did not utilize. 
some key points, land in which a minister to, could get, especially myself when I did not own a property then, I didn't uh, take it up. Um, I didn't take up the two APs where I could import cars, luxury cars, I did not. Instead, I actually used the ministry's car until the day I ended. It wasn't a lavish car, it was a Proton Inspira. Um, three, I mean, all the hatch quotas, all of this, I, I really didn't, didn't take any of those. Um, so I cut down to a great extent. Moving forward, what are the policy changes which I propose and which I have already proposed is to be more transparent on it. So this is where I've argued, for example, the overlapping pensions should be dealt with well. Therefore, try find a way to, so as I mentioned in parliament before, MP, Adon, Minister, Speaker, GLCs, streamline and regulate. For the benefits, I mean, we, we should not have the benefit pinggang bangkok, 50,000 ringgit, that should really be cut off. And it should be reported more transparently. That's why if you look at my travel expenses account, it's minimal. I think it could be the lowest. Because even though I'm accorded to fly first class, I always fly economy. Even when my, my appendix was about to burst, there's a story of this in Philippines, where I came off the sea games about to burst, I still flew Air Asia to the point when the discussion came out in cabinet. You can check this up with other cabinet colleagues that there was an order in cabinet to no longer allow ministers to fly economy because I keep on flying economy and I advocated to fly economy. When there were those who advocated to change their cars to Velfire, I can put this on record that, that in cabinet, I fought against it. I said, no, if really the, the, the maintenance of the huge proton is expensive, allow us to use X70. Walk the talk, right? I mean, if you really want to... <laughs> Uh, show that that, that, that you know, we need to save up money, then this is the least that we can do. So there were many things then. So I think it's not just about practices then, but it's also how I want to move Malaysia forward. Uh, because it becomes ironic if we argue to fight for the poor, the underprivileged, the middle class, but we ourselves do not live moderately. Um, and I'm still learning in the process, and I'll do my best to ensure that we build an equitable Malaysia for all Malaysians. Thank you. A lot of questions are coming in uh, asking about Muda. Um, can you share with us your, your, your ambitions for Muda, your passion for Muda? W what are you hoping to achieve? The reason why I started up Muda is because I want to disrupt Malaysian politics. We want to disrupt Malaysian politics. The days of cosmetic changes is over. I think if we acknowledge that there are structural problems in Malaysia, that we need to overhaul the way we do politics in Putrajaya, right? Stop the politics of threatening, of trying to buy people over. Stop the centralization of power where MPs who support will get more allocations, MPs who don't support will not get allocations, punish voters who don't support you. I mean, it, those days are over, right? We need to overhaul the way we do things. Everything should be done transparently, we open tender, with integrity, decentralized power. The Prime Minister cannot be an all-powerful Prime Minister. The way how we run businesses must change as well, right? The days where we can give direct negos to the multi-billionaires is over. So I remember there's some who say, but Sadiq, you are friendly with some of the billionaires. I dare anyone to check if I ever award any contract to them, supported them without the framework of the law. They have to compete like any other. And if anything, I was one of the ministers who argued for multiple increase in minimum wage, not just minimum wage, I brought the discussion of gaji bermaruah, dignified wage, up, which was much, much higher than even 1,500 ringgit. I pushed for paid internships. I pushed for a higher taxation level for the elites. I was the first one to push for windfall tax um, because I believe that we need to overhaul the way we do things in Malaysia. And what is Muda? Look at those, the 13 co-founders of Muda. These are not political juggernauts with so much experience. Yes, we don't have this great political experience, but these are teachers, people like Cikgu Ayu who started up Sekolah Chow Kid for the underprivileged, right? For, for stateless children. These are people like Mutalib, who's the CEO of a GLC, but who really wants to put his neck in the line to really change Malaysia. These are people like Amir, who is a director of Swaram and who has been on almost every single street protest. These are young corporates who are the youngest people appointed on the National Economic Action Council, tried and tested. So we are a bunch of people, Malaysians, 
of different ethnicities, race, religion, beliefs who want to come together, who really want to turbocharge Malaysia forward and make Malaysia a developed country. And that developed country status has its own planks, right? A country in which system is built on integrity and a strong democratic foundation. A country with a strong education system, which allows education to become the leveraging force, the equalizer among the rich and the poor. An economic system which redistributes wealth equitably. Not about, equi not, not about socialism or, or, or equal outcomes, but equal opportunities, which is very important, right? So that if you start up a business, you won't feel as if you don't have a chance to go up against the economic juggernauts. We, don't know, we no longer want a world in which people like Anthony Tan, who was a Malaysian, who started up my taxi, who will have to move to Singapore because Malaysia didn't treat him well and didn't support him. And in the end, another country had to support him. So developed country status is all encompassing. But in the end, I want Malaysians to know that this is our house together and a house in which we co-own, in which we will build together for our generation and generations to come. You, um, you have put forward a vision uh, of a united, uh, multicultural nation that respects and honors diversity. You have uh, uh, been a strong advocate for greater uh, interracial cooperation. One question that came in was, will the Malays as a community follow such a vision? Will they follow you uh, if you uh, hold to such uh, a vision. I, I'm not making any judgment. I'm just saying that this is the question that has come in. Uh, given the fact that our society is so racially divided, uh, uh, you come in and posit uh, this vision. Uh, others before you have done the same thing and have not made much headway. What makes you think you will succeed? This is the reason why I remain optimistic of our beloved country. Because I believe that the youth energy is unbelievable and they are now the king makers in Malaysian politics and also because I believe the majority of Malays in Malaysia care about issues like any other Malaysian. They care about jobs, that's their number one issue. They care about the state of the Malaysian economy and the cost of living. They care about affordable housing, they care about their children's education and their ability to live with or without a pension and to retire peacefully. These are all issues which are of priority status. And it cuts across issues of race and religion. And there will be those ethnic demagogues, racial demagogues, who will try their best to slice and dice us, to split us apart. But I believe if you sell the vision of a developed country which will serve the interests of all Malaysians, that if you are poor Malay, you will have a place that will protect you, that will ensure that your children get good education and if they study well, they'll get a scholarship to study in and outside of Malaysia and in the end get a good quality job that will not be discriminated based on the status of his race and religion, I think they'll feel happy, regardless whether they're Malay or not. How, how much we, traction, need to, we need to sell that vision. How, how much traction do you have uh, in, 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 in rural Malaysia, like in Kelantan, Chengganu, Kedah and parts of, uh, of the country? Uh, among Malay voters, are you making headway? It is my job to make headway. And if I fail, I will come back up and keep on trying. I will not raise the white flag. Change takes time. That's where the reason why I departed, and again, you can check my fact on this in Kit Siang's book, it's also explained on this. As one of the seven co-founders of Basatu, I wanted Basatu to be a multiracial party. I was the first one who said this on record, even right before election, I said that after one or two electoral cycles, Basatu must be a multiracial party. Why do I share this point? It's because I have faith that the majority of Malaysians, especially when we stop practicing the politics of pandering and move towards the politics of changing hearts and minds, even if the ground is not ready, then we work a hundred times harder to change the ground. Work in building a coalition, a consensus, work in the power of persuasion in changing hearts and minds, right? So let's take the more pessimistic, pessimistic view. The 80% of Malays don't accept this vision. Don't punish them. Don't call them backward. Work in building a vision in which they could be a part of and to convince them that this is good for you and me together. Because change takes time. But that's why I set up Buddha, right? 
I didn't join, I didn't stay in my comfortable ministerial seat in Basatu, even though I was offered. I didn't take up the GLC post, even though I was offered. I didn't kowtow to the threats, even though it, they came my way and my, and my family's way. I didn't join many other parties after because I want Muda to be that disruptive force and it's meant to chart the way forward for the next 20 years. Because if I fail in the next election and the subsequent ele election, it's okay. I, we will deal with it, but we'll come back even stronger and better and you allow us to, 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 to create a competition to the top, not to the bottom. Uh, are you going to be a big force, J15? How many seats do you think you'll be ready to contest? To be honest, that's really up to the rug yet. What I want to do after this, sir, immediately after, and I'm so um, happy with the decision today, and I owe it to our independent judiciary, to the judge, to the system. I thank them for giving hope uh, to a better Malaysia. What I want to do, I want to go on a listening tour. I'm going to go on a listening tour across Malaysia because the day where top bottom is over, I want to listen to the grouses of, Malay of Malaysians in Baling, of Malaysians in Kateri, of Malaysians in, in, in all parts of Borneo. What do they want? What's their vision? And then come up with a plan based on what they want together, piece it up and sell that vision. But the listening tour is a lot more of me listening instead of me speaking. And I want to do that listening tour across Malaysia after this to build that force for all Malaysians. There's a lot of talk about younger leaders uh, You've often been mentioned, uh, Hannah Yo, Yo Bien. Um, do you see younger leaders moving into top leadership positions? How do you get rid of that whole strata of people from my generation who now dominate this scene? And that's why I think people's power is unbelievable and it's priceless. No political party, no political establishment can successfully deal with a movement of the people who demand for change. So instead of only having one or two politicians who may, be, who may have vested interests, I think the people demand for it. And if politicians don't listen, then they will be replaced. And that's the beauty of a functioning democracy. Why I remain hopeful, because, and why I'm also in opposition now, not in government, because people like Hana Yo, Yo Yin, Stephen Sim, Ulya, many others i don't just see them as my political partners i see them as friends and family members someone who i feel so comfortable working with because we share the same belief system we share the same principles and that even if we fail the world doesn't end if we lose our seats the world do not end we work harder after that and we, we seriously do not suffer from a deficit of talent all parties PK has so many great young leaders. Warisan has so many great leaders. Amman has so many. So there are so many good leaders in all parties, but give them a chance. But for that to happen, we need to prove that we deserve it. It cannot be given to us on a silver platter. We need to prove that the Rakyat want change and that we aspire to that change like them. It you cannot be given on left. a silver platter. Uh, I've got one minute left. You are the young, you are the young, you were the youngest minister. What is your uh, what do you have in store for the older people? You're focused a lot on the younger people. What about uh, what's in store for the for the for the older generation? Uh, are you uh, is there a danger that you might alienate them because of your focus on the young people? I don't believe so. Reason being, as I mentioned from the start, in order for Malaysia to become a developed country, it requires a great level of disruption. Young, old. Malay non Malay, Muslim non Muslim, Borneo Semenanjung. I believe all want a democratic system which empowers them, not the elites, not the prime minister, but them. They want a strong economic foundation in which we'll get the right investments, we'll get the right status for Malaysia, which creates and produces the best jobs for them and for their children and for their grandchildren. They want a strong education system which will serve their interests. In the end, that's why I say, if we can see Malaysia as our home, in which we have a stake in, in which we will build this home together and a strong foundation together, it's not just for the young, it's for all generations. And when I fought for the job stimulus package, it also dealt with all groups of people. When I 
fought for many reforms, like the Political Funding Act. It's meant to deal with an unjust economic system which gives so much power to the elite who's able to fund all parties. When I fought for the reforms on asset declaration, I was the first minister to declare. It's meant to decentralize. When I give fair allocations, and you can check this, in cabinet, I push for Trunganu and Klantan to get direct allocations of federal government, no more parallel political bodies set up in which money will be directed to them and not to the democratically elected state government. Klantan got 400 million, Trunganu got 1.2 billion. I fought for it. Not just that, in KBS, I was the first minister to return back the right to host Sukma to Kelantan, where they'll get 200 million ringgit of sports infra, despite being an opposition state. Why do I show all of this? Because it cuts across issues of race, religion, and age. And I want to fight for Malaysia for all Malaysians. And Thank Muda, and, and let me tell you, Muda is not just a fact of age. It's a state of the mind. Muda is a new brand of Malaysian politics to overhaul and disrupt, to be the force of change, and to make Malaysia a dignified country and to make Malaysia a developed country in which you can stand tall and proud wherever we go to say that we are proud Malaysians and we come for a country which is multiracial, multireligious and prosperous, a place in which we live with human dignity. Said Sadiq, thank you for talking to Critical Conversations and uh, thank you to all of you for, for joining this, uh, this conversation too. And may I take this opportunity to wish our Christian friends, a Merry Christmas, and to the rest of you, to everyone else, a very happy new year. Said Sadiq, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, everyone. Eh, hey, Jackie, yeah. Hmm? Do you want to hear your app, your Nicole? Nicole? She's a boy. Oh, see, I'll call you app, yeah, ma. Okay, look at this, Nicole, look at this. I got a lot of articles, podcasts, and courses. I got a lot of people who are in home. I'm 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 in ทันใจเลยเหรออ่าสู้แล้วตัวไปออนิโคจะไม่สู้ learning